you know, Dr. Craig, of course, needs no introduction to, to you all, but um, just as a bit of a reminder, um, Dr. Craig did his first PhD in philosophy and he finished it in 1977, the second one in theology in 1984. Of course, the philosophy work, the early work was on the Kalam and in, in philosophy and in theology, he, uh, his dissertation on the resurrection of Jesus. And he's been doing academic research and writing and ministry in various forms for, gosh, around 50 years, I guess. Does that sound about right, Dr. Craig? Yeah, I suppose so. It's amazing yeah. how the time flies. So it's, it's been a long time. And of course, he's published, you know, more books than I can count, basically, or research articles than that. So um, I'm sure you all are very familiar with, um, with his work. And we're so glad that you're here, Dr. Craig. We're grateful that you've Thank taken you. the matter of a Friday afternoon to be with us and engage with our students. And um, I wanted to give you a chance to maybe frame our time together by just telling us a little bit about the project you've shared with us in the lecture and anything you'd like us to know about um, the work that you're up to. The talk that I presented is an abbreviation of some of the material in the prolegomenon that I wrote to a projected systematic philosophical theology. I'm attempting to draw together the threads of my life's work into a systematic form. And this occasioned the question as to what exactly systematic philosophical theology is, and in particular, how does it differ from philosophy of religion? And so in the paper that I presented, I basically argued that these are really the same thing. They have the same methods, they cover the same subject matter. Um, the only difference that I could discern was that philosophy of religion will often shoulder a burden of proof that I do not think properly belongs to the systematic theologian. It seems to me that the primary task of the systematic theologian is descriptive, to articulate and formulate a body of Christian doctrine that is philosophically coherent and, and plausible, and that is biblically consistent. Uh, but he doesn't need to uh, prove positively the truth of these Christian doctrines. And often the philosopher of religion will shoulder that responsibility. But apart from that, it seems to me that the uh, disciplines are basically the same. I, and I think that has tremendous implications for our colleagues who are doing systematic theology, as well as for those of us who are doing. Uh, philosophy of religion. Um, so Jane has a question in the chat box. So Jane is asking, um, or I'm just going to read this. So she says, I perceive that you see a problem with the siloing within the field of theology between systematic theology and philosophy of religion that's led to a less robust field in either discipline that could be helped from analytic yeah. philosophy. So this is also a problem with, within uh, the field's of science like astrophysics and biochemistry, what has been the response to your Wissenschaft proposal within the theological community? Should we jettison spiritual formation as an outcome, at least from this enterprise? And then she says, I personally worship God in great measure with my mind, having great thoughts of God through both disciplines. And then let's see, there's one more bit here. I know most of the time we're opposing materialism in our philosophy, but currently epistemology of both science and philosophy is being attacked by postmodern critical theory, particularly standpoint theory. This is creeping into the evangelical church at an alarming rate. Do you see any joining of materialists and Christian philosophers in regards to having an impact in academia and culture regarding these problems? Okay, that's a, that's it was a quite lot. a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's great. Why don't you go back to the beginning and read the first couple sentences of that again? Sure. Uh, so the first part was about siloing between systematic oh, yes. theology and philosophy of religion, and then she brings up um, the the similar siloing within different yeah. scientific communities. Well, let me um, say yeah. that I, I am very concerned about this, uh, and I like that metaphor. Um, obviously, a lot of contemporary theology has been done in ignorance and even defiance of analytic philosophy. I have been at conferences where theologians have been very hostile 
to the input and influence of Christian philosophers. There's a, uh, sometimes just a real visceral reaction to this, and I think it's to their detriment. Fortunately, that is really changing as a result of the efforts of people like Mike Ray at Notre Dame and Oliver Crisp, who are spearheading this uh, movement of analytic theology. And so that has really begun to change, and I find that very encouraging. But I am very concerned that many Christian philosophers are doing their work in ignorance of biblical theology and systematic theology. This first became evident to me years and years ago when I was doing my work on divine uh, omniscience, particularly on the question of divine foreknowledge and human freedom. And I remember talking with Timothy O'Connor at a meeting we were at together, and I, I said to Tim, how can Christian philosophers deny that God has foreknowledge of future contingents? The Greek New Testament has the vocabulary of foreknowledge in it, prognosis, foreknowledge, prognosco, to foreknow. And he laughed and he said to me, Bill, you know that Christian philosophers don't care what the Bible says. Oh, and we God. had a good laugh at it, but I think that remark was more serious than he intended. Where this recently has come up again is in work on the atonement and developing atonement theory. The atonement theories that are out there today among Christian philosophers are basically developed on the grounds of the models, secular models, of reconciliation between human beings who have um, been offended and who need to be brought together again. And so the models of people like Richard Swinburne and Eleanor Stump are predicated upon how reconciliation is typically achieved between two friends who have had a falling out. And then this is applied uncritically to divine human relationships. And it seems to me that this is far too quick. Um, not only is the difference between a God-human relationship vastly different than human-to-human -human relationships, but this threatens to develop a theory of the atonement um, that is unbiblical. Uh, and most of these are theories of the atonement really have nothing to do with atonement in the biblical sense of that word, and therefore I think are, are quite inadequate. And in the next talk that you're going to be viewing for this uh, series uh, next week, uh, again, this same siloing occurs. There is a burgeoning literature among Christian philosophers on the nature of faith. And the way this typically proceeds is you take secular examples of faith. For example, I have faith in my dentist, or I have faith that my son will come home from Afghanistan. Uh, and then these secular models of faith are analyzed, and then the conclusions transferred uncritically to Christian faith and even saving faith. And I believe, again, this is, this is just all too quick, because there may be conditions for saving faith that God has set down that are not characteristic of the sort of generic faith that often uh, occurs in secular contexts. And so the ignorance of Christian philosophers of these biblical materials can lead to views of faith that I think are not merely erroneous, but positively dangerous, as I say at the end of my talk for next week. And this does present a real problem for the Christian philosopher. And I think this is one of the great advantages of a program like Talbot's School of Theology. You have the opportunity there to, to not only do work in philosophy, but to get your training in theology, 
even in, say, New Testament Greek. And so I want to encourage all of you to take advantage of the fact that this philosophy program is at a divinity school of all things, a school of theology, uh, and therefore affords you the opportunity to have this sort of integration and avoid this kind of siloing uh, that Jane has described. Now, you also mentioned, James, that this can occur in the sciences, and there, I think what you have would not be so much a sequestration of science from theology as from philosophy. Um, and I mentioned this in today's paper, that philosophy of science tends to be the heir to Quine's naturalized epistemology. And in my work on philosophy of mathematics and philosophy of time, I ran into this over and over again, that your metaphysics is supposed to be an extension of natural science. And if something is not warranted through the physical sciences, then it can be ignored as part of an alienated epistemology and not taken seriously. And I fundamentally disagree with that. It seems to me that metaphysical views about uh, God make a determinative difference to philosophy of mathematics and to philosophy of time as well. And so this kind of siloing, as Jane puts it, is, I think, detrimental to doing good philosophy of science, too. So there was another aspect of Jane's yes. question, Dr. Craig, which was about, um, I, I think if I'm, if I'm understanding her correctly, she, she was talking about opposing materialism, but then there's this current movement in epistemology toward uh, a kind of postmodern critical theory and the standpoint theory stuff. And so uh, she was asking if she sees, if you see any joining of, of sort of forces, as it were, between materialists and Christian philosophers with regards to those kinds of issues. There, Jane, I'm not familiar with that literature enough to make any sort of intelligent statement. As I indicated, I find the philosophy that is most useful for doing philosophy of religion and systematic theology to be the mainstream analytic tradition and not sort of postmodernist, continental uh, currents of philosophy. And so, frankly, I just tend to ignore these and to... Uh, do work using the tools of analytic philosophy. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, just for those of you who maybe have come in a little late, um, if you have a question, just flag that uh, in the chat box, and I'm moving through those in order that they appear. So next up, I think Jacob Holes, you had a question for Dr. Craig. Yes. Um, first, I wanted to say thank you. Um, my interest in philosophy uh, sort of come, came from reading your work when I was in high school, so it's really great to ask you a question. Um, you. So uh, my question was kind of similar to Jane's um, last question. I was just curious what you think about um, critical race theory sort of being uh, popular in philosophy departments now and how we might interact with that as uh, Christian philosophers. Yeah. That is an area that I am not very interested in and certainly not uh, well read in. We all have to specialize if we're going to make a contribution. Uh, and so that hasn't been one of the areas that I have worked on. I've had some interesting conversations with Scott Waller in the political science department at Biola. And Scott, has argued that critical race theory is fundamentally neo-Marxist in its uh, worldview. It's not traditional classical Marxism because it's not um, opposing the bourgeoisie to the proletariat, but it is neo-Marxist in that it sees the society as basically an expression of the struggle for power and the will to power. And now the bifurcation is between white and black, a male and female, heterosexual and homosexual, um, and that you have the same sort of uh, analysis of 
um, society in terms of this power hierarchy. And what Scott pointed out to me is that this kind of neo-Marxist analysis is fundamentally anti-Christian, because on a Christian view, God relates to us in a power hierarchy. He is vastly more powerful than we are, and yet he does not, therefore, treat us with exploitation, violence, uh, dominance, and so forth. On the contrary, God's relationship to us is one of love uh, and goodwill and to help us to become all that we should be. And so this analysis of um, reality in terms of the, the will to power and the struggle for power does seem to be very deeply anti-Christian, um, given that we do not see an inherent opposition between uh, power uh, and those who are subordinate. Thanks, Dr. Craig. Um, Anthony Roden, I believe, is up next. You can himself and go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Craig, for your uh, lecture. And um, I, I appreciated you mentioning uh, Dr. Liz Jackson as well. And um, we had her very recently on as a guest speaker for some of our Talbot students, as well as Andrew Moon. Oh, great. Yeah, they've been sharing some of their work. So it's nice to see scholars interact and hear from each other. So um, yeah. my question had to do with um, kind of philosophical theology. And I know in a lot of your, your talks and lectures, you often mention kind of the explosion of philosophy that's been going on in Christian circles. And I wanted to kind of get your perspective on the expansion of that. Do you see um, that expanding further to other um, like philosophical reasoning and that sort of rigor in analytic philosophy expanding to other religions or more kind of diversity oh. in, there, in that sense so that it's uh, a lot more arguments and things like that coming from different faith traditions as well? Where well, you... that's a very interesting question. And I have to say that the only place, well, apart from Judaism, of course, there are Jewish philosophers of religion, and, and they've been involved in this current movement right from the start. But I am seeing increasingly Muslim involvement. Um, the Templeton Foundation, in particular, has been funding efforts to promote uh, inter-sectarian uh, conferences between Muslim and Christian philosophers. Uh, Kelly Clark, the former secretary of the Society of Christian Philosophers, recently had me speak to a, a group of Turkish uh, students online. Um, and in Germany as well, I, I know there are Muslim philosophers who are engaging with analytic philosophy. So there has definitely been a, a, a spark in um, Muslim academia toward being involved in this sort of analytic philosophizing. I frankly think that the defense and prominence of the Kalam cosmological argument has drawn in a lot of Muslims. Uh, they have been drawn to the defense of this argument by a Christian philosopher, and I think have begun to uh, be interested in these sorts of topics and to exploit the resources that are available in the history of uh, Islamic intellectual thought. All right, next up is, I believe, Joshua Jones. Go ahead, Joshua. Hi, Dr. Craig. Thanks for joining Hi. us. Um, you, you made a comment in your lecture that each generation needs to do systematic theology. And you made an interesting comment on the section discussing uh, the work done in what you called fundamental theology during the Enlightenment, which engaged with deists. And you commented that there wasn't much discussion of argumentation for God's existence, which would make good sense if you're going up against a deist that already sees that point. Um, so I'm curious for your project and for our generation, if there are certain topics or um, certain 
aspects of theology that you would envision yourself engaging with or you think ought to be done maybe in areas where there were people are questioning things in our time that weren't being questioned in particular i I think of uh things like you know with moral relativism and gender and Mm -hmm. sexuality issues i'm I'm curious yeah with, with your anthropology section of your of your work do you anticipate engaging at all in that those topics You know, quite honestly, I I guess I don't. As I indicated in response to the question about critical theory, it's just not an area of specialization for me. And so what I'm interested in are these sort of traditional questions of the doctrine of God and of Christ, for example. And I do think that even these kinds of topics, though very traditional, Um, do confront new challenges um, in philosophy and in science, Uh, and and particularly, I think, the integration of one's theology and contemporary science is important. And so I have tried to make something of an avocation of understanding the modern scientific view of the world, particularly in physics, in order to see how that is best integrated with our theology. So even in these very traditional areas, it's not a matter of just repeating old theology. It it does need to be updated every generation in light of developments in philosophy and science. But certainly those other areas would be important for philosophers to work on who do feel called to that sort of specialization. Great. Thank you. So next up, um, Steph. Let me ask a quick, may I ask a question? Do you, sure. Tim, as a faculty member, find that students at Talbot in the program are increasingly interested more in these questions of social philosophy or political philosophy uh, Uh, as opposed to the sort of um, old line topics like existence of God uh, Mm -hmm. and arguments for God, attributes of God and his nature, um, religious epistemology, and so forth. Do you see changes in that way? Well, I I mean, that'd be a good question. I, I think of late, it feels as though, yes, there's been a bit of a shift. And, and that's not, actually all that surprising just given what has been happening kind of in the sort of broader societal movements of the last five or so years, I I think, Mm -hmm. where it strikes me that some of the, what, what have, what maybe could have felt like abstruse philosophical subjects in, for example, critical theory or, or the, the issues about gender and sexuality, those maybe felt a little less profoundly, now, <laughs> it makes sense that that they weren't really having a profound influence on the way that we lived our ordinary lives, on our politics and those kinds yeah. of things. Even if they were actually having that, I think the relationship between those things and contemporary high level conversations that, that are broad in scope, not just isolated to kind of ivory tower things, um, I think we've seen the ways that those show up a little bit more overtly of late. And so, yeah. for example, the interest in critical theory has really ramped up recently. And that's not all that surprising because we have a lot of authors right now who are appealing directly to those kinds of issues in order to deal with questions of theological interest about reconciliation and politics and you know, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So I think in, just in the last few years, I think it's really um, increased the interest level. Yeah, that's very interesting. But I will say, you know, as far as our curriculum goes, of course, we're interested in trying to lay the relevant foundational Mm -hmm. philosophical material in order for people to then go on to think about those questions from that kind of platform, right? um, which is what we've always been wanting to do. Yeah, and that's really important, I think, is to have those foundational issues in place. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, There's a lot of people have... Uh, flagged questions uh, coming in here. So, oh, Steph, you were gonna you were gonna ask something before Dr. Craig so rudely interrupted you, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so I was thinking, I mean, I obviously appreciate analytic philosophy and I'm sure everyone in this program does or we wouldn't be in this program. Um, and I think that logical rigor definitely brings something to theology that's needed. And I'm wondering if there's any bits of a systematic theology that you think would be beyond the scope of analytical philosophy. Um, oh. And if there are, what would be the means to bridge that? And if not, how could analytic philosophy encompass no. all of theology? I, I honestly don't see that there is any area handled by the systematic theologian that would be impervious to the tools of analytic philosophy. Um, I do think there are areas of theology that are not part of systematic theology, such as historical theology, biblical theology, moral theology would be another example that is usually classed apart. Uh, but even there, I would say the tools of analytic philosophy can be useful, but I just wouldn't see those as part of the enterprise of systematic theology, which is what I'm interested in. If you don't mind, can I ask a quick follow-up? So um, I'm, I'm currently teaching a class that um, Steph and some others in this call are in on Stump's, well, Eleanor Stump's Wandering in Darkness, and she makes a lot of the sort of second personal kinds of knowledge. So I don't know if you're familiar with her work. I imagine you are because of your attention to the atonement recently and so on. But I, I wonder if, I, I don't know what, um, where Steph was coming from in particular, but the, the, the ways that Stump talks about Franciscan forms of knowing and so on, do you see that playing a role at all in the systematic theological task? Or is that something separate? Yeah, I do think it is something separate, Tim. And that was the point that someone referred to earlier of my thinking of systematic theology as a Wissenschaft. I first encountered this question in talking with German students of theology, and this particular German student was just really, really exercised by the question, is theology a Wissenschaft? And we Americans didn't even understand what he was talking about. We just didn't have a conception of what it meant for theology to be a Wissenschaft. But as I've thought about it over the years, it seems to me that it is, and that therefore the proximate purpose of theology, the immediate purpose of it, is not to have personal knowledge of God in the way that I think Eleanor has said, uh, but rather it is to provide theoretical knowledge of God, and that, that this will have down the... Um, uh, in the long run, it will have definitely application to one's worship of God, as Jane said, and practical application. But the immediate purpose of systematic theology, I think, is theoretical and wissenschaftlich, not personal. Yeah, thank you. Scott Olson, up next. Yeah, um, so one of the things that drew me to Talbot was the emphasis on integrating the spiritual life with our academic life. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's pretty important. And so I guess my question as it relates to systematic philosophical theology, um, does like what does the Holy Spirit have a role in, in the way we do this? And how should we understand the role? Because it feels weird to be like, God, please give me the answer to, you know, this uh -huh. particular theological question. But I, I think it'd be also wrong to say there's just there's nothing that the Holy yeah. Spirit contributes to it. So I'm just wondering if you've <laughs> thought of how that yeah. might look. Um, as you'll see in the talk for next week, I am a proponent of so-called Reformed epistemology, where through the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit, um, we have beliefs of the great truths of the gospel, which are properly basic with respect to both justification and warrant. And so for me, the Holy Spirit plays a vital role in epistemology. Uh, in fact, I, I go so far as to defend the view that the witness of the Holy Spirit is an intrinsic defeater, defeater 
that even a Christian confronted with defeaters that he cannot answer is warranted in his Christian belief because the warrant uh, afforded his beliefs by the witness of the Holy Spirit overwhelms the warrant of these defeaters opposed to it. And so it intrinsically defeats the defeaters brought against it for him who attends to it and doesn't grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit plays a very vital role, I think, in religious epistemology. But even that role is theoretical. I, you're describing a theory of religious knowledge in which the Holy Spirit plays a role. In, in actually doing theology, uh, I tend to agree, I think, with what you said, that I don't think the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to your conclusions. There are just too many godly men who differ theologically to think that if we pray hard enough and walk with the Lord, that He's going to guide us theologically. It seems to me that He's given us the Scriptures as our rule of faith, and that the Scriptures make reasonably clear the central truths of the Christian faith, and that the rest is just um, secondary. Um, and so I trust the Holy Spirit to give me the energy each day, the drive, the motivation, the stick to to keep on plotting and, and not give up, and, and to have the desire to honor Him in all that I do. And so my prayer for my work is that the Lord will use it to His glory, that it will honor Him. Um, and it can do that even if He doesn't lead me to particular philosophical conclusions. I think I've got to come to those on my own, but I, I do think I can pray with confidence, Lord, use this work for your glory and the extension of your kingdom. Does that answer the question? Okay. Next up, Matt and Tim. Hey, uh, hey, Dr. Craig. Um, Hello. Tim, uh, do, I have, do I have time for a two-part question, or should I just throw one out? <laughs> you do you, Matt. All right. You know? All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, so yeah, I had two questions then. Um, so one was just, uh, I know, so you were saying that you don't see a distinction between Christian philosophy of religion and systematic theology in both its subject matter, its methods, uh, you know, and anything like that. But I'm wondering if you see maybe a distinction of uh, maybe, and maybe this gets to more of the sociological descriptions mm -hmm. of it, like you were talking about, but do you see a distinction maybe in emphasis or focus for people in these respective disciplines? Perhaps maybe the systematic theologian maybe giving more emphasis in their study to the biblical material and the philosopher of religion focusing more on the Direct oh, yes, that's, yeah. that, that's very clear, I think, that when you read the work of systematic theologians, they do, even those who are not conservatives, lay a strong emphasis on divine revelation as a basic source of knowledge uh, for their discipline. They're not just spinning uh, webs out of thin air through philosophical conjecture. There is a strong emphasis on the um, essential role played by divine revelation and scripture. Um, so that that is clearly an emphasis, whereas the philosophers will not tend to have that emphasis so much. When I read philosophers of religion, even on topics like faith, as I've said, what they generally will do is develop their theory, and then at the end, uh, go back to Scripture and look for a few proof texts to support the conclusions that they've already arrived at. Uh, it's not a genuine exegesis. Uh, it's more of an eisegesis where they're reading into uh, Scripture the theory that they've arrived at independently. And so part of my goal in doing this systematic the 
theology is to redress that imbalance. I want to have work that is respectable exegetically and biblically, uh, but then also respectable philosophically. And uh, my work on the atonement recently, or on divine aseity, would be, I hope, showcase examples of this kind of integrative engagement. Thank you. Yeah, my, my, unfortunately, my... before you ask the second part, unfortunately, as as I indicated before, there's not a whole lot of Christian philosophers who have the training to do this kind of work. Uh, exceptions would include people like the late Marilyn Adams, uh, who had degrees in theology and philosophy, Robert Adams, her husband as well. Um, Eleanor Stump actually has a master's degree in biblical studies, uh, remarkably. Uh, Stephen Davis is also trained in theology and philosophy. So those would be some standout examples of folks who are equipped to work in both areas integratively. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. My, my second question was just, uh, how do you see the role, I guess, of historical theology fitting into systematic mm. theology? Like, what kind of weight and how do you how do you factor in the weight of tradition and, and so yeah. into your systematic theology? As an evangelical who is committed to sola scriptura uh, as the rule of faith, I don't place a whole lot of authority on church tradition, quite frankly. I think even the creeds, the ecumenical creeds, need to be brought before the bar of Scripture in order to weigh their truth and adequacy. Um, I'm confronting this problem right now in the section I'm writing on divine simplicity. I hate to admit it, but it is true that the doctrine of divine simplicity has been part of mainstream Christian theology uh, going back prior to Augustine, even. Now, simplicity has often been understood in different ways by theologians, but nevertheless, there has been a strong commitment to the doctrine of divine simplicity, and yet I am persuaded, as are, I think, most analytic philosophies, philosophers of religion, that this is an incoherent doctrine uh, that, in a strong form at least, is untenable and should not be embraced. Um, and so there I am definitely bucking the historical tradition. Having said that, though, I think it's very important to be aware of and engage these great figures of the past, like Augustine, Gregory of Nyssa, of course, Thomas Aquinas. You can't ignore these folks. You've got to read them, and when you disagree with them, explain why and offer good arguments as to why you think they're they're wrong. So I it, this is a tremendous challenge, one that I do not feel adequate to, frankly. I mean, I read a systematic theologian or dogmatician like Hermann Bavink, for example, the great Dutch Reformed theologian. His knowledge of historical theology is just encyclopedic, uh, and it would take a lifetime to have a knowledge just of historical theology. And all I can do is hit a few mountain peaks along the way, some of the most prominent. So I, I have a deep sense of my own inadequacy uh, in this area, uh, but nevertheless recognize that if my work is to be adequate, I have to take some cognizance of the major figures and trends in historical theology, especially if I'm going to disagree. Thank you. Just uh, for, for what it's worth, Dr. Craig, first of all, I'm not sure that you are inadequate to that task, but um, oh. regardless of that, um, I, I think it, it just in my experience, um, and maybe you've experienced this too, in talking with theologians about these kinds of questions and about analytic theology, one of the things that they really have trouble with is the lack of attention to the historical tradition. 
And yeah. a lot of theologians are, are very frustrated by the kind of a historical approach. And it mm. kind of makes sense when you think about it. I mean, Thomas was a really smart guy. Um, if he was writing today, everyone would read everything that he wrote. So why would we ignore? Uh, why would yeah. we ignore his work when we're trying to figure out what the truth is? You know, and yeah. Um, yeah. so anyway, um, just to add that little that little piece, I think next up yes. um, is Lamumba. David, go ahead, Lamumba. All right, good. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? All yes. right, great. How are you, Dr. Craig? I am well, thank you. I, and I have Good. I have a two-part question as well. I'm going to try to be brief. Um, I, like, I've watched many of your lectures, people like Dr. John Lennox, Dr. Frank Turek. Um, and so I always think of, because the, the end of all we do, well, is philosophy, theology, in the Christian realm, it is to bring people to Christ. Um, so I, one of my questions is, what is the impact of what you've done in terms of um, seeing people either converted or at least uh, opening up their minds to maybe changing what they currently believe. Outside of yeah. the people that, you're elect that you are um, having a dialogue or the discourse with, because I think their minds are already made up. And I mean, I think it'd be incredible if they do change their minds. Um, but I, I look at it as you're probably trying to reach people that are on the fence or that yes. or have some great areas that they need to be filled in. So, I mean, what is the impact you've seen in terms of people actually either coming to faith or whether it's a Muslim or a Buddhist or whatever they are saying, you know what, maybe I need to recheck or rethink um, the, 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 the beliefs I currently espouse now? Yeah. I would just issue a small correction to what you said. While I think that evangelism and the desire to bring people to Christ is really important, I think the overriding aim of our work is to bring glory to God. And one of the ways we bring glory to God is by bringing people to a personal knowledge of God. And so one of the central purposes of the ministry I have, Reasonable Faith, is evangelistic, to bring people to Christ. And I have been thrilled uh, at the number of people who have uh, written uh, expressing how they have e either come to faith in Christ or come back to faith in Christ after a period of falling away through seeing a debate or hearing a talk or watching a video. Um, and if you'd like to see some of these heartwarming testimonials. There's a section on our reasonablefaith.org website called Testimonials, and there you can find these testimonials that come in every week, week after week, uh, telling of how God has used this material to change their lives. So it is really encouraging to see that the Lord is using this to bring people to a knowledge of Himself. Thank you. Ramama, well, did you have another question? You said it was a two-part question. Was that the only... Was that no, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop there. I want other people to have a chance to. Okay, thank and, you. And if we have some time later, maybe I'll, I'll ask. I, I'll, I'll keep you in the queue. Um, Adam Priestley. Hello, Dr. Craig. Uh, thank oh. you for your work in your ministry. And uh, I enjoyed the, uh, the video lecture. Um, uh, we've kind of skated around this topic a little bit, so I thought I'd, I'd ask you, you mentioned how uh, analytic philosophy would be really useful, and I know you've had some debates with some Thomistic philosophers, I'm thinking of Brian Huffling and Richard Howell, who were both my previous teachers at the school that I left, um, oh. and uh, I'm curious why Thomistic philosophers are so against analytic philosophy, uh, and oh. if you had any thoughts on that. Uh, it seems like analytic, analytic philosophy is uh, something that's bashed uh, among Thomistic philosophers. So I'm kind of curious if you had any thoughts about that. Well, I think that may be a peculiarity at Southern uh, Evangelical Seminary rather than in general, because uh, most analytic philosophers think that Thomas was an analytic philosopher, and most of the contemporary Thomists that I read 
uh, are fully engaged with analytic philosophy. I mentioned that I'm working right now on the doctrine of divine simplicity. And this has been the subject of article after article and book after book by people employing the methods of analytic philosophy. And I don't sense any sort of uh, rejection of the methods of analytic philosophy on the part of Thomas. Rather, what I find there is an emphasis that Thomas is working with a, a very different metaphysical framework than what is current in modern philosophy, and that therefore, if we're to understand him, we need to engage or, or enter into his horizons and to understand his defense of divine simplicity within the Aristotelian Neoplatonic metaphysical framework that he was working in. And that's quite correct. That's just a matter of doing good historical uh, philosophy, but it, that's not a rejection of analytic uh, philosophy as such, but just saying be sensitive to the metaphysical assumptions of the historical figure that you're engaging with. Otherwise, you might really distort what he is actually saying. Yeah, I think actually at one point, Greg, you distinguished between analytic philosophy as a kind of um, tradition of knowledge or, or a set of views versus analytic philosophy as a kind of toolkit. And I wonder if sometimes what's happening in those conversations is that folks are thinking about analytic philosophy as yeah. a, a set of commitments to particular claims about epistemology or metaphysics or whatever. And then, of course, I mean, a lot of analytic philosophers reject those things. So that's not really a great way to think about analytic uh, philosophy. Oh, I'm, anyway, I, I think you're probably yeah. absolutely right about that, Tim. They look at modern analytic philosophy and they see that they think of uh, properties as abstract, uh, platonic objects to which particulars stand in a relation of exemplification. And so when it's said that uh, God is identical with all of his perfections, they think that means God is identical yeah. with an abstract object, and that's absurd. And, yeah. and what they'll say is you've got to understand Thomas's metaphysical framework, which is very different, and that's a, uh, an important point to make, and not to identify analytic philosophy with this set of theses as opposed to the toolkit. So I think that's a good admonition. I mean, one way even to think about analytic theology is a kind of retrieval of scholastic theology. I mean, mm. there's a sort of, just stylistically, it would make a lot of sense. But yes. okay, Mark Stanley, I think um, you, you haven't asked a question, I don't think, Mark, have you? Because we're circling back around to people that have, and we only have a few minutes left. So go ahead, Mark. Okay, thank you. I, I want to ask a humble question. I, I, I hope I'm not simply misunderstanding something, but um, I, I want to touch on uh, Dr. Craig, um, your understanding of how Christian philosophy and Christian theology touch. Because it sounds like what you're... How they touch? Right, right, how they touch. Because it sounds like really what you're saying is that both Christian philosophy and theology have the same sources of knowledge and yes. the same goals. And so, uh, and, and that goal will be articulating a, a Christian worldview. And so it sounds like really what you're saying is that you're proposing a strong integration between the two. And so if you could start your own seminary or, or your own academy oh. or, or you were king of the world or whatever, would you always want to teach philosophy and theology together? Uh, what, what, what's, what's the dividing line there that you think might separate those two? Well, as it's, it's more than integration. Uh, the way I see them, they're basically the same discipline. They, they overlap almost completely so that it's not so much a matter of integration, it's just doing the job well. And, and I think that many people don't do the job well because they do it in a lopsided manner. Uh, so I would found a program like the one at Talbot School of Theology. I think having this philosophy program at a divinity school is a stroke of genius because you can get not only your philosophical training, but you can do courses in systematic theology. And some of you, I think to your credit, even do New Testament Greek. And so come away from your training at Talbot well-equipped to do the kind of integrative work that I'm suggesting needs to be done. So 
that's what I would envision would be a program like Talbot's. Well, that'll make a great ad. We'll, we'll clip that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> didn't plan that. For, uh, all right. So I think we have one more uh, person who hasn't asked a question yet. And then um, I think we're going to transition to the other part of our time. So Sean, you're going to have the last, the last question here. Hello, Dr. Craig. Nice to meet you. Hello. Um, you said at the beginning of this talk that to be a Christian philosopher, you should really find a place to specialize in so you can contribute to the conversation somewhere. How did you discover where your place was in this conversation? Mm -hmm. And is there any suggestions that you can give us of how to go about that? Well, let me just share with you my own personal uh, story. I have never sought to work on topics that are deemed relevant or important, which is probably why I don't work on gender theory or critical race theory or things of this sort. I, I'm just not let that motivate me at all. Uh, rather, I, and I haven't even worked on topics that are important to the discipline. Rather instead, the way I have chosen my topics is based upon what I'm passionate about. What do I really care about? What lights up my board? And the advantage of working that way, I have to tell you, is that it enables you to endure the long slog that is often necessary to complete, say, a doctoral dissertation or a book. Um, I've talked to some guys who at the end of their doctoral dissertation, they say, I'm so sick of this topic. I never want to look at it again. Man, I don't feel that way at all. I am so passionate about these subjects that I just keep working on them my whole life. Um, and so I don't know if you can do that yourself, but I, I, I'll just say that it's worked for me and that the great advantage of is that it is energizing, it is inspiring, and it gives you the endurance to complete the task. So as you're thinking about what you want to specialize in, I would encourage simply to say, what am I really passionate about? What do I really care about? And make that your area of specialization, and then let the chips fall where they may. That's fantastic. So um, I just want to pause for a second and just say thank you, Dr. Craig, for uh, taking all of these questions about this project that you've sure. been. Um, we've been at this for about an hour now. So I think what we're going to do is transition. And of course, um, Sean, you just asked a question that I was going to ask. And I can't believe you would do that to me. Okay. Um, you have really. What a segue. You know, I know. Is that, he has this disarming <laughs> accent, and then he just goes and steals your questions from you, you know? Um, anyway, so, um, Dr. Craig, I guess what, how I'd like to spend the last little bit of our time um, is just in, in a little bit more of, of the space that, that Sean just introduced us to. Um, and I just have some questions for you about uh, just looking back on these 40, 50 years of, of work and ministry. Um, and so I'm, I'm just kind of curious to, to get us started. When you think about all of the projects that you've engaged in, all of the books mm. that you've written, all the papers that you've written, how would you kind of group the major topics? So let me just give you an example of the sort of thing I had in mind. You've talked both about the nature of time and so on, and about divine eternity. So would you put one of those projects under the umbrella of another? Um, is, is there some sort of way that you've kind of imagined, this is what I'm working on now, and this is what I'm working on now? Can you describe those kind of major movements in your work for us a little bit? Yes, I can, because it was very deliberate. When oh. I finished my doctoral work, and began teaching at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in the MA program in philosophy there, I thought, well, now, what am I going to specialize in as a Christian philosopher? What should be my research program? Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'll tackle the coherence of theism. Anthony Kenny's little book, The God of the Philosophers, really impressed me. And so I thought, I'll 
take on as a kind of re long-term research program a philosophical analysis of the attributes of God. Well, I never realized how much I had bitten off. I spent the first seven years working full-time on the attribute of divine omniscience, and particularly God's foreknowledge of future contingents. I then turned to divine eternity and spent the next 11 years working full-time on the subject of God's relationship to time, which took me deeply into the philosophy of time. Then thirdly, I tackled divine aseity, and I spent 13 years full-time working on this question of God's relationship to abstract objects, and how could God be the soul ultimate reality, the creator of everything outside of himself. Well, that's only three of the divine attributes that I had gotten through, and that brings us up to just a few years ago. So it became pretty clear to me that I, I would never be able to finish my project, but nevertheless, that is how I conceive my life's work, is being under the umbrella of the coherence of theism. Now, my wife, Jan, and several others have been urging me for a number of years to write a systematic philosophical theology. And I realized that in order to do this, I would have to bone up on certain areas of theology in which I was weak. One of these was the doctrine of the atonement. For many years, I had been deeply dissatisfied with the atonement theories that my colleagues, I mean Christian philosophers, I don't mean my Talbot colleagues, had offered. And I kept waiting for someone to step up to the plate and offer a robust defense of a Reformation theory of the atonement, and just nobody seemed to do so. So I, I finally decided I'm going to have to tackle this myself. And so I spent about two years working on the doctrine of the atonement. And in two years, obviously, I couldn't master the literature, either the contemporary literature or the historical literature, in the way that I had for, say, God and time or God and abstract objects. But nevertheless, I felt that it was sufficient for me to come to some studied, solid views on an adequate atonement theory. The other area, then, was anthropology, and I thought I have got to come to some kind of a resolution about the question of the historical Adam. And so for the last two years, I have worked on the question of the historical Adam, and this was a work that was both heavily exegetical took me into Old Testament uh, studies as well as New Testament, and then heavily scientific. I learned so much about contemporary paleoanthropology and uh, the wide diversity of scientific theories involved in the study of ancient man. And again, I couldn't hope, couldn't hope to master the literature, but nevertheless, I was able to come to, I think, some solid defensible positions on that. And so that work is forthcoming, should be out this year, uh, called In Quest of the Historical Adam. And with those behind me then, I felt I was now ready to tackle this systematic philosophical theology. And so for the last 10 months, I have been engaged in working on this systematic philosophical theology. So that's how my research has unfolded uh, over the years. That's really helpful. So what I'm hearing you say is that we can look forward to seeing your systematic philosophical theology in about 67 years. That's, uh... <laughs> if it takes the same amount of time, I, I'm hoping, I am hoping to complete it in five to 10 years. That's wow. my goal. So I'm, I'm hoping that the Lord will grant me to live that long and uh, that I will be able to bring it to completion. Well, I, I'm excited to see it, uh, Dr. Craig. I think that's. I think great. it's so, going to be really an important work. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, the second question I was going to ask you was about whether there was a through line in your work. And it sounds like you've already answered that because it's the coherence of theism up until just a few years ago yeah. was the main sort of through line. Um, yes. And that, that's a really interesting way to think about those other big projects as well. So I'm curious, though, do you have a favorite? I, when you think about all the projects that you've engaged in, is there one that you think that was well, the one that yeah. I really just enjoyed the most? Or maybe it's the most Man. important or something like that. Oh, okay. Now that's a little bit different. I believe, Tim, that for the, the church and for theology, my most important work has been this recent work on the atonement. Hmm. Because the doctrine of the atonement lies at the very heart of the Christian faith. And so I really believe that more than the cosmological argument, more than divine aseity, the work that the, the Lord will use in the life of the church um, will be this work on the atonement. Now, apart from that, I, I really enjoyed the work on divine aseity and the work on God and time. I think that probably my two best books would be the book Time and Eternity, uh, which is a semi-popular version of the book, the work on God and time. And then the other one would be God Overall, which is a semi-popular version of the work on divine aseity. Both of those are works that I'm proud of. I'm, I'm curious how you think about the popular level work that you've done as well. Do you... Um, when you think about things that are sort of important in the life of the church and so on, do yeah. you tend to think first about the academic work, or do you look more to the the more popular level work that you've done? I do look more to the academic work, Tim. I think in the <laughs> long run, that's the work that will make a difference. Think of people like Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and the lasting influence. Um, I want to produce a body of work that will still be read in a couple of centuries by future Christian philosophers. So the popular level work, I think, is fleeting and transitory, but I'm praying and hoping that the scholarly work will have an enduring value. Uh, my perspective is the long-run perspective. Yeah, yeah. That's that's really interesting, actually, because I think sometimes our temptation is to think the other way. You know, it's yeah, we do JP, this academic work, but you know, JP and I have thrashed this uh, together in conversation uh, about which is really the most influential and important, because undoubtedly the the popular work has tremendous influence in inspiring students to do study themselves in philosophy or philosophical theology and uh, affects the life of the church. I mean, look at the contemporary movement in apologetics that has been birthed by the revolution in Christian philosophy that has taken place. It's, it really has changed the church, and it, it's changing it in internationally as well. So there is great influence there. There's no doubt about that. And, and it is uh, an issue that I think each one of us has to wrestle with and come to terms with. But here's the good thing. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. My strategy, as you probably noticed, is that I write a scholarly level book, and then I write a popular level distillation of the same thing, the same material. So I've got the Kalam cosmological argument, but then I've got the existence of God in the beginning of the universe. I've got the problem of divine foreknowledge and future contingents from Aristotle to Suarez, and then I've got the only wise God. Um, I've got assessing the New Testament evidence for the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus, and then I've got the sun rises. You know, so my, my inspiration was Immanuel Kant, Kant wrote the critique of pure reason, which nobody could understand. And so he wrote this little distillation of it called Prolegomenon to Any Future Metaphysics. And I thought, why can't I do the same thing? I can write popular level versions of the same material, and that way you get double mileage out of the same work, and you reach completely different audiences. 
Um, at least I thought I thought I would. I, I've been surprised at the number of philosophers who have read my popular level books. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's because I think the you academic can, ones are so expensive, Bill. <laughs> that's true. Sadly, that is that that's a big drawback. But um, but anyway, it's not mutually exclusive. And then you just let the chips fall where they may. Which one God chooses to use, it's up to him. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, here's, a, here's kind of a, a, a related question. Have you ever started a project and not finished? Uh, have you ever had something that just sort of didn't work out? You know, you started thinking about something and then you just decided to abandon it uh, partway through. Has that happened? No, to you? no, I don't think so. Uh, I, I no, I, I I haven't. Everything that I've put my hand to, I've completed, and that's probably related to that mm. criterion I used for picking my projects, namely things I'm passionate about. Yeah. So, I, how do you think of success for these projects? Like, what what is what's goal that you have? So. You know, I mean, I can imagine if you had some criteria of success and you're halfway through a project, you might imagine this just isn't working. Yeah. It's not going yeah. in the direction that I want. How do you judge whether you've succeeded in completing a project? Well, um, one would be whether or not I have dealt with the literature on that subject fairly. Mm -hmm. Is there important literature that I've neglected or overlooked or have I mastered the important literature on this topic and interacted with the arguments. And what I found, Tim, in, say, working on divine aseity for 13 years, is that after several years, you've really mastered the important literature. And what happens is the rest of it becomes repetitive. And it, people just are repeating over and over again the things that others have said in more influential and important works. And I wanted to take cognizance of those because I wanted to master the literature. But in all honesty, the project could have been completed earlier. And that's why I didn't feel bad about cutting short the work on the atonement or on the historical atom after just say two years on each project, because I felt I had mastered the important literature and the arguments. And if then I feel that I have come to some reasoned position that is well argued and takes account of the views of my opponents fairly, then I feel like I've been a success. Um, and I don't worry about book sales or things like that. That kind of success isn't important. It's more academic success. Have I made a contribution to scholarship? And that would be based upon the worth and completeness of the arguments that I offer in the book. You just ignore external metrics entirely? Like, do you ever look and see how many citations you had or anything like that? Oh, or is that something that you just ignore? I ignore that. Um, yeah. I mean, I do get royalty statements from the publishers, but they're generally so paltry. Yeah. <laughs> that I don't even look at how many copies have actually yeah. sold because <laughs> there's so few, it would be embarrassing, you know? So I just take the check and Jan deposits it and we just go on, you know? So, um, uh, I mean, I, I, it would be disingenuous to say that I take no cognizance of it. I mean, in fact, it was frustration with the fact, Tim, that I felt that for 25 years, I had been working in this area, and yet I felt like it was done in a corner, that nobody was taking any cognizance of it. Nobody was paying attention to it. It was because of that that I started Reasonable Faith. Reasonable Faith was founded in order to be a megaphone for my ministry, my work. It would be a way of disseminating the material via the internet um, that would reach people that I wouldn't come into contact with personally or wouldn't have read my books. What I did not realize when we founded Reasonable Faith was the degree to which YouTube would become the primary means of disseminating 
my material. What we found was that there were these pirated videos of my debates that other people were posting on the internet. <laughs> had completely unauthorized, and they were getting thousands and thousands of views. Well, we eventually realized we've got to start doing this ourselves. Yeah. And so we started a couple of YouTube channels, and one of these fellows, Dr. Craig Videos, it was called, he said the stress was killing him, so he just donated the channel to us. He, he gave it to us. But Wait he a minute. The I've seen that channel, Dr. Craig. That's not, that wasn't a reasonable faith channel no. at first? <laughs> this was some guy. I don't even know his name. He wanted to remain anonymous because he, he was getting all these awful atheistic attacks, and oh. he was really stressed out. And so he said, look, I'll just give you this YouTube channel. And so we're gr grateful to this fellow for doing it. And, uh, and so, as I say, I would be disingenuous if I were to say I don't pay attention to or I'm unconcerned about how many people I, I'm reaching. We obviously are. Um, and so we're trying to exploit as many media as we can, print media, internet, personal contacts, in order to get the material out there. Wow. I'm, I'm sure at some point that's a, that's a hard thing to balance, right? Because there's, there's a way of approaching yeah. that sort of task that can lead you to sort of value things that you know you shouldn't value. Have you, uh, how have you tried to manage that? Is it just, yeah. is it just Jan there in your ear <laughs> telling you, you know, don't, don't go that route, you know, or how, what, what sorts of support systems well, have you had that have allowed you to, to not go too far down the road of valuing those? Yeah, of she, she is a big help in that regard. Uh, she says, I don't want to be famous. She said, I value our private lives that nobody knows about and, and is obscure. She values that obscurity. So when we started Reasonable Faith, we made it very clear that this would not be done at the sacrifice of my scholarly integrity, that what I would continue to do would be to continue to write, research, produce material, and then we would have others who would be in charge of running the website and running the YouTube channels and so forth. So when we started this, we talked to uh, Kurt Swindoll, who is a kind of oh. consultant, and Kurt said, you're going to need to raise about $100,000 to start a website and hire a webmaster who can do this. And I said, all right, we can do this. We'll trust God for $100,000. And so we went out and appealed to friends and acquaintances and so forth. We raised this $100,000, hired a webmaster and others, and launched this ministry called Reasonable Faith. And since then, we have a full-time executive director now, Michael Lapine. Uh, apart from Jan and me, he's the only full-time employee of the ministry. And Michael runs things, and he carries the burden for me so that I can devote myself to a life of scholarship, and Michael runs reasonable faith. Yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting. Um, um, and so I, I think we can sort of wrap this up a little bit. I, I so appreciate you, Dr. Craig, being willing to sort of share some of your thoughts. And, and I know that that's a kind of intimate thing to be sharing with us. And I just want to express my appreciation for that. I do have one more question for you. Okay. And it's just this. Why in the world did you ever shave off that magnificent beard oh. of yours? I mean, what, what possessed you to do that? horrific act of self-mutilation. Yeah, you've got, you've got a fine beard, I see, Tim. Um, I originally grew the beard to look older. When I applied to the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for a grant to go to Germany and do this doctoral study under Wolfgang Pallenberg, I looked so young and, uh, you know, wet behind the ears that I thought, I'll grow this beard and this will give me a little gravitas, you know. And so I wore a beard for many years, but then pretty soon 
it started making me look older than I wanted to look. Uh, so by the time I was 50, I thought I don't want to look any older than 50. It's time to shave it off. And it was starting to turn gray anyway. And so that was when I shed my beard was on my 50th birthday. And our, my little daughter, Charity, who had never known me any other way, oh, no. I, I never realized the impact it would have on her. She said, I want my daddy back. <laughs> she was, felt like I was a different person. And so, uh, yeah, I, uh, that's why I did it. And uh, man, if I were to grow it back now, it would be totally gray. I would look so old and haggard. I, you know, I, I just, I don't want to do that. Well, you were talking earlier about how you want to be anonymous and not be noticed. You know, you can just grow some kind of scraggly beard and just wander around Atlanta. Wander the streets. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> sorry to make you go there. Um, I don't, you know, this is on Zoom, so we can't really give you a round of applause or anything. But again, we just want to express our appreciation to you for being here. And, and we're so grateful that you're a part of our community and, and are willing uh, to take the time. We're looking forward to next Friday as well. So... Um, thanks for doing this today, uh, Dr. Craig, and we appreciate you, and we'll, we'll see you next week, okay? Okay, thank you, Tim. My pleasure to do this today. I, I love the Talbot community, and uh, you students who are there are privileged to be a part of this fine community. Uh, may God really uh, bless you and equip you for a life of service.